Good evening, everybody. Chris Oedid. Oh, I don't know what day this is going out on, but a day. <laughs> um, I am here uh, with the wonderful Carolina from Charco Press. Can you say Charco for me? Because I know that it's pronounced a little bit differently. Charco. Charco, yeah. You said it perfectly, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, these are a selection of their books. They all have these very distinctive covers. Um, I first came across Charco um, when I was working at Edinburgh Book Festival last year, because um, your entire collection was there. And um, you are, of course, an Edinburgh-based um, publishers. Um, Strom, tell me a little bit about what Charco does, what its aims are, and how you came to set it up. Right, well, thank you for having us. It's, it's great to have the opportunity to, to chat to you and to chat about Charco. And hello to everybody. Uh, so we're an independent publisher that uh, started in um, 2017 and we're based, as you said, here in Edinburgh. And <clears throat> we published exclusively authors from Latin America uh, and we tend to um, publish authors that have never been published in English before, uh, which doesn't mean that they're not, you know, well known or recognized or even award winning authors that just haven't been uh, brought to English before. Um, so we have been publishing about uh, five to six titles a year, fiction, um, novels and short stories. And um, and yeah, we, we have the, the, the luck to have the support of people like the Edinburgh International Book Festival from the start, and they've been bringing authors every year, well, from this one, of course. And um, so even though our authors um, tend to be living in Latin America, and it's quite hard for us to, to bring them so that they can have direct access to their readers and vice versa, we have had the support of, of uh, um, yeah, people like the book festival in Edinburgh to bring them over and and uh, and yes so that's that's what we do. That's it. How did you come to set it up? Am I right in saying that you were in academia or you are still in academia as well and you were uh, doing translation yourself? That's right yeah so I'm originally from Argentina uh, but I've been here in the UK for over 20 years now, uh, always involved in the academic world. Um, I studied literature and translation and then I did my PhD in Latin American literature here in Edinburgh and I taught. And through all those years, uh, my impression was that um, there was a real gap uh, in when, it, when it came to contemporary Latin, well, all of Latin American <laughs> literature in, in the English speaking world. And that definitely became more apparent, you know, the more I got involved in, in research, but also in teaching and talking to colleagues, specializing in the same area of expertise. And, um, and after, um, you know, the recession hit in 2008 and I was looking for an academic, you know, job, that was my big aspiration. And it just took a long time to come, it never came actually. And during that time, um, you know, sometimes we've got to see the silver lining of things because during that time um, I started thinking that um, maybe there was a, another way to make an impact and to try and put these passions together, you know, the passion for Latin American literature and, and the passion of, you know, teaching and, and, and making uh, readers, you know, um, have an access to this, this field of literature that I always found amazing and amazingly interesting. So uh, together with Sam McDowell, um, who doesn't come from a literary uh, background, uh, he comes from a more entrepreneurial and, you know, bringing the ideas to action, which is sometimes, you know, what you need. Some say, yeah, we can do this. Uh, we just, you know, started Charco Press and we, um, we, we did it, you know, completely independently. Uh, and then uh, as we grew, we started getting more support and more visibility and, and, and an amazing um, reception from the readers, mostly. So, um, so yeah, so it's, it's a good message to people that are thinking, oh, should I do this? Should I not? You know, always, always try, I think. Yes. <laughs> what was the process like from sort of first hearing about a book to publication? Um, how long does that normally take? And are there, what does choosing, you know, when you, how many books do you hear about that you, and then how many do you sort of get to choose from? Oh, well, that, yeah, it's, it's a great, it's a fascinating process, I think, and it can take, it can take, a, you know, um, 
it can take a long time. It depends on the on the book. Um, but just to give you an idea and to give you an example, if uh, sometimes there's a, an author that I'm interested in, or uh, or I hear of a book, you know, that's it's making uh, some noise in in a particular um, literary scene, so that you know, I zoom in um, from here from Edinburgh, and I and I follow that until uh, something makes me want to you know to try and grab the book to to talk to the author or their agent, and uh, and if and if I think that's a book for, for charcoal, then uh, generally I need to talk to the agent and the author and kind of negotiate. Um, is this too detailed? <laughs> no, 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 please. This is exactly what I want to hear. <laughs> okay. And then sometimes it's a translator that approaches me and says, oh, look, you should really consider this author or this book. And I also pay attention to that uh, immensely. And, um, and when the, the rights are secured, um, then the process starts and if it hasn't been a translator that has approached me i always try and think very carefully it's like a curation for me i always try and think very carefully uh, who the best translator would be for a particular voice i think that's very important it's not just any oh i, I don't just go through a list and go oh now it's you know this person's turn i think certain translators are more um you know there's an affinity to certain voices so uh, when things are agreed with a translator and the, the pairing is, is kind of made, then um, the translation process begins, you know, we allocate a, a date, a year, um, and sometimes, you know, the translation process needs to happen quite quickly and sometimes they can take more time. But on average, you know, it can be, it can take a year or more from the moment I sign the contract for the rights till the first kind of the draft of the translation comes in and then we do a very meticulous process of copy editing the book so i have a team generally of translators that come in as copy editors they check the translation i'm almost done <laughs> just going to say I talked to Robin Myers so oh. she's one of your copy editors so we sort of mentioned this a little bit about how um and she I think she was in, um implying that you're maybe slightly unusual in getting translators to also be your copy editors and how much she enjoys that um, so I'm wondering if oh fantastic no no she's great she's great yes well um because of my, I guess, particular uh, position of uh, being from Argentina, but living in the UK and uh, knowing the original text um, in Spanish or Portuguese, and then understanding the translation, I, I, I think uh, it's very important once the translation is ready and it reads beautifully in English, to then someone go back to the original and say, well, did you, did you get this sarcasm here? Did you get this reference? Because you know the whole point of 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 a novel can get or a story can get lost if a sentence is portrayed in a serious way or not in an ironic way, you know. So those tiny details or details that might seem tiny can, I think, bear a lot of meaning. So yes, yeah, so all all of our copy editors um, do have the tremendous task of checking the translation against the original. And then once that's ready, we, we have the magic of our designer, <laughs> who is Pablo Font, who's an Argentinian designer, who is very involved in the music world out there. So that's one of the first things I saw by him were actually hosted or concerts or, you know, thank you. <laughs> no wonder they're so cool. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I shall pass that on. Yes, he's got this very psychedelic. Mm. Uh, in my view, the psychedelia there, and uh, so um, so he he gets a, a few months to try and mull over, uh, you know, what the book is about, what the author wants in the cover, if the, if they have you know something strong they want to see there, um, and then he has to fight his own demons about oh the palette, you know, what color shall we use? Now? And then does it get harder? Because, like, do you know what I mean? Like, is he running out of colours? <laughs> That's what he says, but, you know, I, I ignore him because he's, he's the artist. I'm sure he can come up with more colours. 
<laughs> so, so yeah, but from coming back to your first question also, from the beginning, we, because we were coming out of nowhere, we felt, you know, the designer had to be one of our strong points, you know, that you could see uh, a charcoal book and go, oh, that's definitely a charcoal book, so that it was classic, but also that it pulled you in. Uh, so, um, so very lucky to have Pablo on board, yes. Fantastic. And then um, just to wrap that up, how does the how does the printing go? So once it's designed, it gets sent to uh, where where are your printers based? On the wall. Our printers are in Cornwall, um, DJI, and uh, they're fantastic. They're fantastic. They never let us down. That would. So once we've uh, worked on the cover and the and the, the blurb and and on the design the kind of the interior design is the interior design you know inside so uh, good to go we send it to the printers and then we get files to be approved and from then on it can take three weeks three to four weeks till we see the final um book so so that adds almost another month till we we see and smell the book yes <laughs> Um, have you ever had any times where you've gotten like a, your first proof through and you've realized there was a big a big something that needed to be changed oh <laughs> <laughs> every time so i've not blended them all um i can't remember uh right now i i was going to tell you that the first the first books that we printed um time i love and slam virgin uh, and this is not an exaggeration for for you know for impact. Uh, both authors had been invited to the Edinburgh International Book Festival, and we were on the taxi to go to the events. And the van from the printers arrived. I, until that point, we had no books for them to talk about in their <laughs> in their event. So that was. I'm glad I didn't die at that moment but that was very nerve-wracking because we were supposed to have had the books you know weeks before and there was a delay and um so that was that was my very kind of uh, first hand feeling of cutting it fine <laughs> so we took the books with us on in the taxi uh i thought it wouldn't happen uh but no big mistakes no we, we've had to we've had some um Kind of unfortunate or we had to restart translations that's happened to us a couple of times which is not unfortunate it's just you know uh we don't want to do it because it's like in this very um you know it's not it's not a delicate process but it's a process where everything slots in and then suddenly if you go to if you go to go back to square one it all goes back in time quite a lot so but i always think that's better rather than to um, publish a book and then you think oh not sure if that's you know faithful to the original voice well never mind so I couldn't sleep if I if I did that so so yeah we've had that um, so I was wondering if you wanted to talk about um, your most recent books I think this is this is this the most recent book you've had out or is we've that... had date after that uh, which you've had and I, I should have brought with me and I don't have it the one that's forthcoming but Next interview. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, you, do you want to talk a little bit about them, especially because this one has been um, nominated for the Man Booker International Prize? Isn't it? That's right. Yeah. So Tina Aaron came out in November last year, um, and yes, it's currently uh, shortlisted for the for the International Booker Prize. Uh, and as it stands, we don't know when they're going to announce the winner. We think sometime late summer. Uh, so uh, it's great because you can, you know, you have plenty of time to read it if you haven't yet. And, um, and Gabriela Cabezón Camarena is an Argentinian author. Um, and um, the two translators, they're actually based here in, in Edinburgh. They're actually two academics uh, from Edinburgh University. And um, it's, um, um, well, I think recently I was asked, you know, which book I would recommend to um, surf through <laughs> this crisis. And I thought of that one because I think it's, um, uh, I'll tell you about it, about the plot now, but it's a book that helps you maybe um, change your perspective and appreciate the beauty uh, just of the simple things around you, you know, 
be the landscape or, um, or you know, your own uh, passions or your own desires is suddenly, you know, have, have a communion with that in a different way. And um, it's a book that will make you laugh a lot as well because it's quite mad in, 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 in certain angles of it. But it's, it's also a deeply um, revolutionary book, I think, because it, it takes um, a kind of um, a legendary or a, a mythological figure of Argentinian um, folklore, as it were. It's, it's, she, she takes the Martin Fierro, which is um, a book written in the, in the mid 1800s that we all had to read, you know, in school. It's, it's like the, the, the literary Bible. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a foundational text. Um, and um, in, indeed about nation building and, you know, our, 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 how our collective imaginary was constructed and, uh, you know, the, the good, the bad, all, all of the landscape. And uh, Gabriela, the author, takes that and just reformulates it from the point of view of the wife, who this main character, who's a gaucho, uh, abandons, you know, that's the, that's what we always repeat it, oh, you know, Martin Fierro abandons. The wife was only a 14 year old, you know, so she takes this, this whole myth and t- tells it again from the point of view of this girl who's, who doesn't feel abandoned, she feels completely liberated. And she gets into, it's, it's like a travel novel as well through the Pampas. Um, and she discovers this Scottish woman who's, who's out there looking for her husband. And I'll tell you no more. <laughs> Oh, oh, I'm so excited. I actually haven't read it yet. It's on my profile and I cannot wait. Um, My favourite one I've read of yours so far was actually The Wind That Laid Waste. Um, So if anyone's interested in that one, that's (laughs) also very good. Um, I was wondering, you have this thing where you commonly have two translators translate work. Um, How common is that in sort of the field of translation and often so well occasionally um it's also you am I right (laughs) um I think I've got I'm sure there's one you also translated this one didn't you um so I was just wondering what that process is like and how um you find it um well I think I think it's quite um I don't know if I can say it's a common practice but it's not an uncommon one to have co-translations um and I think um, they obviously vary a lot and they, and they vary per pair, as it were. Sometimes it's more than two people, um, but I can only speak of, kind of my experience uh, as a co-translator and also as the publisher of co-translators. And so, yes, we've had, we've had um, a couple, you're right, yes, one well, more than a couple, a few. In the case of the book we just talked about of, um, uh, yeah, of, of Tina Iron, uh, Fiona and uh, Iona, they're, um, the colleagues at the at the University of Edinburgh, and they're both specialists on Argentinian literature. Iona more on nineteenth century, and, and Fiona on twentieth century. And um, it was a matter of them wanting to work through this book together, um, uh, which I thought was just perfect, and I think it shows in the in the in the final translation because they could bring so much knowledge you know from the from two different centuries into this world that they recreated through through, through translating um, and i know if you can interview them separately if you want, but i know they had a lot of fun you know they had a lot of fun and they were um i'm now probably misquoting them but uh i think it's very interesting and i can i can i can relate to that when you when you translate but you also have to explain your own choices to your co-translator you know you start learning a lot about yourself as it were you know why did you go for that word and not this other one especially well in that case you know with sexual or erotic scenes there's a lot of um you know inhibitions you know one of them would go well let's just call it this and it's like no you can't call it that you know that kind of conversation can be Fantastic. I had, I had a lot of those conversations with Annie McDermott, who co-translated, we, or we co-translated um, Harwick's um, Feeble Minded together. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's an enriching, very enriching process um, in my experience. Uh, I couldn't translate 
into English, myself not being an English speaker. So the books I've done um, as a co-translator with Annie and with Fionn Petch, who did Fate, which is the most recent publication, um, it's a it's a different, I think, process than having two English speakers translate because I just go, you know, this far and then you as the English speaker can can come and meet me and we just elaborate things from what I can bring from the original language and you can provide from you know from your perspective. So that that's also been a lot of fun. And then Juana Atko and Sophie Hughes did um Giuseppe, Giuseppe Caputo's an orphan world together. Yes, and, and that that was um again a different experience to them. I think uh they hadn't I don't think they'd worked together before and uh, I think they learned a lot from each other and and uh, I also know you know had lengthy conversations and I, th I think it's a, it's a very um, it's, it can only be a, a more an enriching experience for the translators and for the product itself for the book. Um, yeah, that's so interesting it's so interesting and to sort of um, move on to um, maybe some more book recommendations. Uh -huh. Um, are there any books um, that if someone was looking at um, particularly Argentinian literature or um, more Latin American literature as a whole, are there any in English translation, um, maybe other than your sort of Allende's and Garcia Marquez's, um, that would be a good place to start? Obviously, anything by Chaco. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, oh, well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, well, apart from what we've been publishing, um, well, recently there's, there's, there's been like a, like a wave of excellent um, translations of excellent books. Uh, certainly the, uh, one of the other shortlisted books for the, for the Booker International Hurricane season uh, by Fernanda Melchor um, from Mexico, translated by Sophie Hughes. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great book, a great um, I don't know if it's a great place to start, but it's certainly a great <laughs> book to read. Um, oh, there's many. Mariana Enriquez, uh, translated by Megan McDowell. She's, she's a fabulous uh, storyteller. Her, her short stories and her novels are fantastic. Um, let me think. Well, there's been some, inter some classic ones. Um, well, not so classic, but Bolaño would be a very interesting author to, to go to. Uh, if I go down the classic line, I'll, I'll get lost. But Borges, certainly, I would always recommend if no one's read Borges before. There's some fantastic classic translations by, I think, published by Penguin. Um, and um, I've got an Everyman Classics edition, I think, as well. Oh, oh, thank you. There you go. Yes, very, it's very fancy. <laughs> very fancy, great. Uh, he's, he's super, just to go um you know, he only wrote short stories and, and poems uh but you know if you just need a short pause and you don't want to you know dive into a novel just to read one of his stories i guarantee he'll leave you thinking for days just go oh what did he mean and they're completely kind of universal you know they would say Borges could have written in any language you know because his mind was elsewhere I, I always feel like they're like reading a philosophy paper <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. No, it's a relief he didn't write a novel because yes, yes. too much. And uh, so Samantha Schweblin is someone I recommend as well. The books uh, also translated by Megan McDowell, published by One World. Um, yeah, there's there's, there's there's a lot, fortunately, at the moment. Yes. Um, so what are you working on next? What is your forthcoming book? I know we don't have a picture to show, but. Um... Oh. <laughs> Well, I didn't think of bringing anyway. So the forthcoming, our forthcoming title is very exciting. Is um, uh, a novel called Holiday Heart uh, by. Oh my gosh! What am I doing? I've got it here. Yes. See, you're more prepared than me. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot it only arrived like two days ago. <laughs> Fantastic. There you go. Thank you. So Holiday Heart is coming out uh, end of end of the month, twenty fifth of June, or yeah, I think so. And it's the same author as Fish Soup. Uh, people may know that book. We published that two years ago. And um, uh, this is Margarita Garcia Ravallo's most recent novel in Spanish. Uh, and it's been translated by 
Charlotte Coon, who also translated Fish Soup, and she also translated The President's Room for us, which is a, a, a wonderful gem of a book. And, um, uh, and yes, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing what readers think, uh, because it's, um, Margarita has a very uh, particular sense of humor, which I think if you, if you get, it, it's just extremely enjoyable. She's very sharp, she's very dry, and she presents us with characters that, you know, we're almost definitely not going to like uh, as people, but who are going to challenge us in, I think, in every possible way. So it's, so it's quite an um, interesting reading experience like that. It's not a novel that, you know, it's going to make you feel all lighthearted and, and uh, um, in that way, but it's, it's, it's a novel that will make you think and, and make you think about these people as characters and how much you may see yourself in them. Uh, but yeah, I hope, I hope people, people like it. It's, it's a great, great novel. Um, and after that, we have um, a musical offering by Luis Agasti, who's the author of Fireflies. Um, very different book altogether from Holiday Heart. Uh, and a bit of a continuation of Fireflies, who, for those who read Fireflies and that kind of, it's a, it's a more, um, how should one call it? Um, it's like a fun take on er erudism, if you can say that, you know, like building up stories that you don't know if they're fiction or not. Um, um, so I'm looking forward to that. And after that, we have Dead Girls um, by uh, Selva Almada, who wrote The Wind That Lays Waste. Yes. Very exciting. That's, that's, that's going to be a big, big release. And uh, two more this year, um, Andrea Gestanovic, she's from Chile, and we've got um, one of her novels coming out in English called Theater of War. Um, um, and Daniel Saldania Paris, who's a Mexican writer, uh, we've got his, um, well, I think it's his second novel, uh, but it's the first one that we're publishing called Ramifications. And um, so a lot of books still to come out this year. It's very exciting. Yes. I can't wait. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I noticed that like often you are publishing an author, multiple works by the same author. Is that, um, is that something you try, like intentionally um, do? You want to publish a whole author's catalogue? Yes. Well, thank, thank you for mentioning that. Yes, in general, that, well, I mean, there's a notion to, 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 to be published, yet yeah, a notion of authors. Uh, but it's also, I think, an interesting uh, project, uh, or at least that's how I see it uh, so far. When you bring an author to, to you know, English, which in turn opens so many other doors still, you know, into other languages. Um, we always say that in Charco, we, we not just um, believe in, in a book, but we believe in the whole kind of project of an author. So um, if, if there is response from the readers, I think it's, it's only fair, as it were, to offer the reader the possibility of, um, you know, of, of entering an author's universe, um, not just one book, uh, because you know, it, it's, 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 it may be just one book, but it's, it's, it's good to have the, the, the offer, I think, the possibility to access, yeah, the, just different stages of, of the artistic production of an author. So, so we do try and uh, bring into English, at, at least, I don't know, the whole of the catalog. I hope we, we live long enough to do that. <laughs> but, but certainly, you know, the most recent work so that they, the, the, the readers can enjoy and, and, you know, look forward to, oh, what came after that? Um, but at the same time also continue to bring new voices. And that's that that is a beautiful note to end it on. I think what a wonderful like take on sort of the philosophy um, and an importance of a small publishers. Um, thank you so much, Carolina. Thank it's been you. an thank absolute you. joy. Oh well, likewise. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, and, and congratulations on your initiative. I think it's fantastic. So, uh, so keep it up, and I wish you all the best. Yes. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.